I, I imagine you've seen also a number of contractors that have gone out of business. Uh, Unfortunately, yeah. What do you think are some of the maybe top two or top three reasons of why that happens? Um, I would say stretching too far too quickly is one of the, the, the real issues. People that are trying to grow faster, the geography, geography expansion has always been an issue. Every, I, I haven't seen probably more than two handfuls of people do that well. And a lot of times it leads to the downfall of the company. So, and some very large companies that has led to a, a lot of downfall. Um, I think that's a real issue. What about making the jump to a commercial spec? I think that, yes, that's a, a really big issue. And the reason is because of there's a, and, and our commercial spec team will, will tell you, um, over the years you learn when you deploy to a commercial job site and you're doing commercial bids, you have to have a whole different um, checklist of what you need to know to be able to bid that job and not lose your shirt. You need to know the cash cycle. You need to know power on site. You need to know accessibility. What other trades are going to be there? You know, there's there's so many things on a commercial multi-story building um, that you have to know to get your quote right. Um, that unless you've got padding in there, most most of the time you're not going to get the job. So you're going really sharp to get the job to to get experience on how not to do it. <laughs> Right. So that the next time you get the job, so start off small. If you're getting into commercial for the first time, you're going to go for, you know, plazas, small commercial. Um, you're not going to go out of the gate and try and bid a complex commercial project right out, right out. And my understanding too, is that you really have to understand the, the change order game too, because Absolutely. that's where a lot of Contractors, I mean, if, hey, I'll, I'll break even on the project, but I know my change orders because every single job site, I mean, gets yep. turned sideways because of, hey, you know, we had, here's a new change that we had to make. And, and if you're not billing for a lot of those little changes like that, then. That actually, I've seen that put 10 rig customers out of business. And I've seen that happen when they're heavily weighted in production building, um, uh, part of the, the channel as far as, um, deploying their rigs and having eight out of 10 rigs on production building sites. And they will chew you up and spit you out only from a sense of there's multiple sites, multiple lots that they're trying to get closed every day, every week. And your, your rigs can deploy and they will call you out to touch places up. And so if you don't have really good operations control, and if you haven't read your contract, <laughs> you have to know your legal lang language in your contract and you have to know when you can bill extras and hold your line on that. Good contractors understand contracts. They understand what they can bill for as extras and they do that very regularly. Don't leave it to the end of the month. Yeah. And it's important to get those contracts right too. You know, the little differences like, um, um, you know, what's, what's the minimum depth required versus nominal depth required, you know, things it, like that could make or break you. It can kill you. It can kill you. I've seen, um, spray foam contractors that have installed, you know, 300 houses, um, with, uh, assemblies in the garage ceilings and them, them getting, getting inspected. And they've been like half an inch off and had been responsible for repairing those 300, all the drywall down, all those. Can you imagine how pissed off that builder was? Those homes were occupied wow. by the time that had to get done. So that can really um, hurt a spray foam contractor badly. If you're in that two and three rig zone, that can really be a death knell. So you have to um, weight your, where you're playing. So if you're construction, if you have a contractor that has d uh, the percentage of their business that they're doing is in customs and they're thinking about attacking the production home segment, they have to be careful that they don't bite off too much before they understand that whole contract, understand how that change order process works and make sure that they're not experiencing, you know, basically being taken advantage of. I have heard, um, now this, I've heard internationally, not in the United States, um, but I've heard builders say to me before, we will take advantage as much as we can of the contractors. 
So they're expecting contractors to not put in the change orders. That's part of the expectation. And I love home builders. That's something that we do. There's some home builders that we work with very closely that aren't that way. They're very professional um, and, and, you know, leading the game. But then again, you know, just like any segment, you've got the top and you've got the bottom and somewhere in between. So our spray foam contractors, everybody out there needs to just be aware when you're moving into a change of what you're good at. So if you're good at custom homes and you're looking to add production in, you know, I've always said network with your competitors. That's some of the best advice I could give to anybody in any city. It's not, it shouldn't be that you're out fighting each other. Whereas an industry as together, you should be networking together. You should understand who's who. Don't be afraid to have lunch and, and talk about the industry. You don't talk about obviously things that are, are not legal to talk about, but it's really good to get together and understand what's happening in the industry um, so that you can make your business better.